Hello, welcome back to the channel. It is a unique video today. I'm going to look at uh, Alex Lifeson and Gibson, a 50-year ride. I'm a huge Alex Lifeson fan. He's one of my favorite all-time guitarists. Very influenced by him as a songwriter, as a tone master, as a uh, just an all-around great guy, Canadian guy, fellow Canadian. So let's just watch it and just uh, break it down a little and see what's what's going on here with Alex, my buddy. <laughs> The first guitar I got was a Kent acoustic guitar. It was a cheap Japanese guitar. It was $10, I think, and I got it for Christmas in 1966. I played that guitar that whole year. Uh, as painful as it was, the action on it was terrible. I begged for another guitar and I got an electric the following Christmas. And it was also a Japanese guitar, a Kenora, that I think cost my parents $59. And I played it as much as I could, but I always dreamt about having a Gibson. They just seemed so beautiful and so out of reach. Isn't that great? I mean, uh, can't we all relate to that? Our first acoustic guitar. Was your first uh, guitar an acoustic? Leave a comment below what your first guitar was. Mine was, my aunt gave me a sort of a, a half size acoustic guitar. And I remember instead of a pick, I used a, a bread, one of those little plastic. Um, and that was my pick. And uh, I remember playing on that, really liking it. And I was getting into King Crimson at the time. I was like, I was only like 10 or something, 10 or 11. Yeah. We all have stories about our first acoustics, yeah. I used to go to Long McQuaid, a music store ah. in Toronto, every weekend. Cool, Aunt Long McQuaid's. Uh, my guitar store was uh, Austin, well, Austin X in St. Catharines, Ontario. That was my very first experience as a guitarist, going to the Walter Austin X. He, he was a an accordion player in St. Catharines. And then uh, later on, uh, when I moved to Toronto area, or I was going to Toronto and stuff, yeah, I got Long and McQuaid's too. I could totally relate to Alex. So much in common here. And I'd spend a Saturday sitting on an amp and pulling down a 335 or maybe a, a Les Paul or, or an SG. And I would play for about an hour. Yeah, how many guitar stores have these kids come in and they're playing guitar on the amps and the uh, and uh, 10 years, 20 years later, these little kids are freaking famous and uh, making amazing music. Well, there you go. Like, Lifeson was one Until of them. the salesman came by and said, okay, get lost, kid. And I'd come back the next weekend, and then the next <laughs> weekend, and then the next weekend. Yeah, we've all been sort of, uh, we've all annoyed salespeople, eh? All of us guitarists sitting in music stores, you know, uh, when you don't have the money and you're just saving up. And he'd let me play for an hour and then he'd kick me out. <laughs> but that's the dream that we all have, right? Always a Gibson. Always a Gibson. Nice music there. That must be something of us new new music he's working on, I don't know. In 1976, I visited the plant in Kalamazoo, and while I was taking a tour there, I ordered a 355 in white, and a double neck, and a dove. In fact, I used the dove for Closer to the Heart, but that white 355 has become the iconic Alex Lifeson guitar, and I just absolutely adore that guitar. It served me really, really well. I think I'd seen more photographs of me with that guitar than anything else. As the years rolled by and we continued touring at a crazy pace, my collection of Gibsons grew more and more. I developed a very close relationship with the people at Gibson and asked me to be involved in a, a model of a guitar that really suited my purposes. And I thought, you know, really the Les Paul is such a great platform. How can we improve that or at least make it more attuned to what I required as a player? 
I'll be honest with you, I've never owned a real Les Paul. They've always been very expensive and uh, I want to own one. I had a Les Paul copy that was a Japanese copy of it, which was really actually pretty good. But uh, I, I tended to be a Stratman and a Telecaster man and uh, also had an Ibanez uh, ES200, uh, AS200. It was like a, it kind of looked like that Gibson 335 that he played, that white one. It's a little bit like that yeah. style. So we'd spent, I guess, about two years uh, developing the Axis Les Paul Alex Lifeson model. Mm. Ooh, now I'm interested because that's one thing I didn't like as much about Les Pauls is they don't have whammy bars, and I really love to have a whammy bar. Mind you, a Telecaster doesn't know what whammy does it. <laughs> nice. It has the piezo pickup. It has a Floyd mm. Rose on it. Uh, it's been sculpted so the hand can get up nice and high on the fretboard. And it's relatively lightweight, so it doesn't kill you after a while. <laughs> the introduction of the Epiphone Alex Leipzig model, based on that Gibson model. It has all the same attributes and characteristics that that guitar has that I desired so much when we designed it. The look. Oh, I just remembered I did have when I was a young teenager, I did buy a, a solid body, kind of a Les Paul shaped guitar that was uh, kind of inspired by Les Paul. The sound, the playability, and the utility. It's all there for the player at any level. I'm very proud of this guitar. I think you'll love it too. That last picture of Alex, he looks like he lost a lot of weight. Holy camolis. Um, which looks good, I guess. It's always good to be uh, thinner. <laughs> Anyways, uh, cool. Thanks for watching that video along with me. It's It sort of gets you in the mood of thinking about guitars and and uh, teching out, geeking out on the tech of guitars. We all love our guitars, don't we? Sort of a walk down memory lane as well, so sort of, you can sort of relate to Alex. Just imagine, he was dreaming about having that out of reach Gibson, and now he's got a couple of those guitars, at least a couple so far from Gibson that are his design, and he shepherded along all uh, all about these guitars. I'd love to play one. So spiraling out, we'll talk to you later. See ya, as Dean.